All right. Hello, this is uh, Dr. David Leader speaking to you from Tufts University in downtown Boston, Massachusetts. This and, is uh, this is John Mahalski. Uh, today we're uh, we're going to have a uh, as uh, David uh, very well introduced himself a presentation, and we have Michael uh, Bassard. I'm a moderator along with Michael. And uh, first of all, we'd like to thank you, Doctor, doctor for for uh, taking the time out to uh, do this webinar with us. So we greatly appreciate it. Absolutely, my pleasure. So with that, Michael, I'll let you uh, you know do, do the formal introduction of the doctor, and we'll go from there. All righty. I'm Michael Bessert. I'm a patient advocate for the Scleroderma Foundation. And welcome to the Scleroderma Foundation Michigan Chapters web-based 2020 educational series. This webinar is being offered as part of our strategic planning efforts to move towards web-based learning experiences for the next three years to reach more patients, caregivers, and family members who seek to obtain accurate information about scleroderma. There will be individuals from all over the world that will access this webinar emphasizing that we can be connected and sit in front of our computers obtaining accurate educational information while staying in our homes and offices. This program is made part and possible by an unrestricted educational grant from Ectalon and Bollringer Ingelheim. We thank them for their generous support to the scleroderma community. This webinar will focus on dental challenges for the scleroderma patient. The Michigan chapter and tri-state chapter will be presenting educational webinars throughout 2020, and you can locate information about them on both of our websites. If you'd like more information about these, you can find the information in the national weekly e-blast or on the Michigan chapter's website, which is scleroderma.org forward slash Michigan and Michigan is all spelled out and it has all small letters. Or the Tri-State website, which is scleroderma at tristate.org. Once again, all small letters. Today, we have with us presenter, Dr. David Leader. Dr. David Leader is the director of Tufts University School of Medicine, Dental Medicine and has a degree in a dual degree program. He is associate professor of the Department of Comprehensive Care, and he is the lead practice coordinator for the second floor predoctoral clinic. He graduated from Emory University in 1981 with a degree in art history. He is a member of Tufts University School of Dental Medicine class of 1985 and earned a Master of Public Health from the Tufts University School of Medicine in 2013. Dr. Leader is nationally recognized expert on scleroderma and oral health. He helped manage the writings of Massachusetts Oral Health Guidelines for Pregnancy and Earl Childhood, Massachusetts Department of Public Health 2016. He currently is the Health Policy Fellow with the American Dental Association Health Policy Institute and Tufts University School of Dental Medicine. His research explores the possible expansion of the scope of dental practice. Dr. Leader is also the 2017 recipient of the Tufts University Provost Award for Outstanding Teaching and Service. With that, Dr. Leader, you have the, the microphone. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and by the way, thank you for, uh, for pushing me up a little bit in rank. I am the director of the dual degree program here at Tufts University School of Dental Medicine, but not the director of the whole school. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> sorry about that. That, no, that's fine. I, I'm either misread or, or you know, mix my words. My apologies, but no, I'm I'm going to send that one up to the dean and have him approve it. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, I want to thank the uh, Michigan chapter for inviting me to uh, to speak to y'all on uh, on scleroderma and oral health. And when I think about scleroderma and oral health, uh, can we have the next slide, please, and then the next one. See, so when I think about scleroderma and oral health, what I think about is what your dentist needs to know about scleroderma and what your physician needs to know. Because I think that most of the people who have scleroderma understand the issues that you all face, issues of your mouth being dry, uh, you are more apt to get tooth decay uh, because of that, because it's harder to keep your teeth clean. And... Um, and then the medications that you take. So we'll be talking about all of that 
uh, if you can go on to the next slide, please. And I want to emphasize that the treatment of any patient with, uh, with a chronic condition like scleroderma requires a team approach or interprofessional practice. So when, uh, when I've had patients who have scleroderma, and by the way, I stopped seeing patients on my own last April, and uh, now I primarily see patients who have scleroderma in my, uh, my students' practice at school. So several of my students at Tufts University are caring for people who have scleroderma. Um, we like to make sure that we're on board with their physicians and that their physicians understand what the oral health issues are. And here you see me at a patient education seminar in 2014 in Peabody, Massachusetts, and we're going to be having another one. Yeah, that's me that they're pointing at. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have another one coming up in, uh, in a, a few weeks on April 4th. Uh, here you see me with a team of rheumatologists. Uh, Dr. Fengali Bostwick does a lot of basic science research in scleroderma. Uh, Dr. Andrew Plout and Dr. Harrison Farber are gastroenterologists who work with a lot of patients who have scleroderma. So when I'm treating a patient who has scleroderma, I often see the way that the systemic illness is affecting oral health and also the way their oral health affects their systemic health. And it's important for me to be on board with all of these people. And um, a special shout out to Robert Sims, who's the, who I think up until just a few minutes ago was the director of the scleroderma clinic at Boston University uh, Hospital. And of course, Dr. Philip Clements is a very well-known rheumatologist who works with uh, scleroderma. So on to the next slide. And the learning objectives for this presentation are, um, you will learn about the oral health implications of scleroderma, as if you don't already know, uh, how to speak with your dentist about the way scleroderma affects you, but also how to speak with your rheumatologist and your other physicians about how scleroderma affects your oral health, uh, how your dentist and physicians and other healthcare providers may work together to help you improve your oral health, and um, how to find a dentist who can help you or how to help your dentist help you. Uh, on to the next slide. I'm not going to read this word salad out to you, but uh, I invite you to request a copy of these slides. The, uh, what does your team want to know about you and scleroderma? So on the medical side, it's important to discuss with your systemic medical specialists, your physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, uh, occupational therapists, physical therapists, uh, what are the oral health issues associated with scleroderma? Because they may not even realize that this is a problem for you. Should, does, should, yeah. should the patient, when going to a new dentist, first of all, is that obviously they fill out their forms and stuff as being, they normally ask about, you know, drugs and medication as, um, you know, obviously, is there a way to search for a dentists that are familiar with scleroderma and, how, and ones that are more accommodating? Besides yeah, that, is, that is something that we are going to uh, have later on in the talk. I have okay, thank you. on that. Sure. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, so what are the, let me see, what can systemic healthcare professionals do to help improve your oral health? And how do I refer a scleroderma patient to a dentist? Because physicians may not know. How do I refer a scleroderma patient to a dentist and which dentist? And also I get calls very often from patients who would like a letter to their health insurance to help cover the cost of dental treatment uh, when they have scleroderma. Now, some systemic medical health insurance 
will help to cover the cost of dental treatment. But dentists do not know how to write these letters. We don't know the medical codes. So we have to work with your physician to get these letters written. And if anyone needs it, they are welcome to get in touch with me and I'll give you my contact information at the end. And I can send you a letter that uh, Dr. Tracy Freck of, uh, of Utah wrote. She's a rheumatologist who specializes in scleroderma. And uh, I will be happy to send that letter to you. So what about the dental team with respect to scleroderma? The dental team may not realize that some of the oral health issues that you have are specifically related to your condition with scleroderma. Uh, Many dentists do not know what scleroderma is. If, uh, if you think about it this way, there are over 100 autoimmune diseases. Dentists spend a lot of time studying systemic disease. So they do get many, we do get many lectures on autoimmunity and autoimmune disease, but everything we learn about scleroderma in school might be five minutes of discussion during a three hour lecture on things like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus erythematosus, and Sjogren's is <laughs> something that's very important in the industry. So we may need a little information. I'll tell you what information we need. We'll wanna know how scleroderma affects your systemic health. What medications do you take? And it helps for you to bring a list of all the medications you take and what you're taking them for. Remember, we're going to be giving you other medications and we need to know if there are any interactions. Also, we need to know if any of the medications you're taking are affecting your oral health and many of them do. Who are your physicians? Because we may need to talk with them so we'll need their contact information. How can oral health providers work with the medical team. Your, uh, your dentist may not have experience with that, although most younger dentists, most recent graduates have experience working with other healthcare providers in their uh, education, in their training. This is something that's relatively recent. So someone my age, I'm almost 60, um, may have no or next to no experience working side by side with a physician, but the students that I'm teaching, this is a regular part of their education. I'd, and once again, dentists know dental insurance well, but not medical insurance. And they may not know how scleroderma may or may not affect dental implant treatment and orthodontics. So we're gonna talk about all these things. On to the next slide. So how does scleroderma affect oral health? One thing is, most people who have scleroderma, your mouth is going to be dry. It's going to be dry because of the effects of scleroderma on your salivary glands. It's also going to be dry because of some of the medications that you take. It affects, scleroderma can affect your teeth and the bone around your teeth. So. Uh, we can have a condition called osteolysis, and we'll talk about all of these things more uh, over time. Uh, so scleroderma can eat away at the teeth and at the bones and weaken them. Uh, you may have pain and difficulty opening your mouth, and you may have sclerodactyly, where your uh, hands get into the characteristic scleroderma position, and may not it may make it difficult for you to hold dental floss or brush your teeth. And then once again, oral effects of medication, the way some medications affect your, your, uh, your mouth and your teeth. Um, and then psychological effects of having a chronic illness. And of course, gastroesophageal reflux disease, which affects most people who have scleroderma. So we're gonna talk about all of these things. On to the next slide, please. So dentists have a unique ability to diagnose scleroderma from dental x-rays. So this is a radiograph and, and I have permission of this patient to use their image. 
uh, in my talk. And if you will uh, hit the forward once, we'll have an enlargement of part of the x-ray. There you go. So the teeth are not held into the bone directly. The bone does not touch the teeth. The teeth are surrounded by a ligament and the ligament holds the tooth into the bone. If you have scleroderma, it's very common that the ligament will become larger and then, it, and then your teeth will feel wobbly because you have a thicker ligament holding the tooth into the bone. It does not make your teeth rise up out of the socket, but it does cause the bone to be eaten away from around the root of the tooth. Many dentists will see that all of your teeth are loose and they will think that you have serious gum disease and it's not gum disease. And this particular issue does not require treatment. Now, for this particular patient, they had another issue as well. So around their upper teeth, most of the bone was just gone. And that's called osteolysis, where uh, the cells in scleroderma eat away at the teeth. So uh, the upper teeth have no or almost no bone all around their roots. And when I took impressions for this patient, I was very afraid that the upper teeth were so loose that when I took the impression out, it might take a tooth or more teeth with them. So I took special precautions for that not to happen. There was an interesting study that, uh, oh, by the way, this is nothing new. Uh, I have a citation underneath the, uh, the image, widening of the periodontal ligament in several teeth is pathognomonic for scleroderma. Pathognomonic means when you see this sign, it means you have this disease. So this only happens in scleroderma. And it may relate to disease severity. And then if you look at the next citation under that one, this was a study that was done very recently in Canada. So the first citation is from 1981 when I was in dental school. The second citation is only a couple of years old, maybe about five years old. And in Canada, in a study, they found that the more of this widening of the ligament around the tooth you had, the more severe your scleroderma was, was or was going to get. So I know that for many people, it can take several years to have, a sclero to have scleroderma diagnosed. But with an image like this, a dentist would know, a dentist who knows about scleroderma would know that you have scleroderma and could advise your rheumatologist. Can we go on to the next slide, mm -hmm. please? Scleroderma increases your risk of tooth decay. And this cute little slide was made by my 31-year-old daughter when she was in middle school. She won an award for it, so I like to keep using it. It demonstrates all the different ways that scleroderma increases your risk of tooth decay. So it lowers your host resistance for tooth decay by causing your mouth to be dry, by making it difficult to do your oral hygiene, brush your teeth, floss your teeth. It makes it harder for you to get professional care. We know that about 30% of people who have scleroderma have trouble finding a dentist who will even take care of them. Uh, issues with diet, gastroesophageal reflux disease causes more decay. Um, it's hard for you to clean your own teeth when your tongue is affected by scleroderma and your lips. So for me, if I have food stuck around my teeth, I can use my tongue to wipe the food away. But some people who have scleroderma cannot do that. And my saliva washes away this food and my lips can move around and, and move away bits of food from around my teeth. In scleroderma, that doesn't happen. And this is what, this is called self-cleansing. Um, and then issues with depression. Um, we know that people who have depression are less likely to 
uh, to perform all of their activities of daily living, which include brushing and flossing your teeth. Sometimes it's just hard to get up in the morning and then we start throwing roadblocks in front of you. You have to brush your teeth, you have to floss your teeth, you have to rinse with fluoride, you, um, all of these other things. And um, it's, it, and I know it's hard, but then if you're not following these activities of daily living, then your oral health becomes worse, which can increase your depression. On to the next slide, please. So at nearly every dental school, maybe every dental school now, we are teaching our students and, and our doctors to diagnose patients for their risk of tooth decay. Some patients never get a cavity. I am very fortunate in that I haven't had a new cavity since I was a teenager. But uh, some people especially people whose mouths are dry or have a problem with gastroesophageal reflux disease, may have a new cavity every time I examine them. So we say these patients have high risk for tooth decay. And the treatments for high risk, uh, oh, and by the way, everyone who has scleroderma should automatically, your dentist should automatically be treating you as if you're high risk. So if you can go on to the next slide, The treatments for dry mouth are going to be symptomatic, and these are treatments that everyone who has uh, high risk for tooth decay, or nearly everyone, should be getting. Um, you can rinse with this super saturated calcium phosphate rinse called Cafasol. I'll talk with you about that a little bit in a minute. Uh, artificial saliva will make you more comfortable, like Salivart Oasis Biotene Rinse. And by the way, I just need to point out that I have, sadly, no financial interest in any of these companies. Um, using sugar-free candies, sucking on sugar-free candies, will uh, increase your salivation. Using fluoride gels and rinses will help uh, keep your teeth hard or rehardened teeth that are starting to soften. And we can prescribe medication for you that will make your salivary glands perk up and start pumping out more saliva. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. But this is pilocarpine and 7 milli or salogen and evosac. Now, On to the next slide. Before we leave, there's just a quick question. Are there things that pe that you have run into that people do that they slide, shouldn't please. do? Oh, I can't hear you. <clears throat> Are there things that people do that, that, that they shouldn't do? Oh, now I can hear you. Uh, what were you saying? I, I apologize. Are there okay. things that some p patients do for treatment that they shouldn't be doing? Like what? I don't know, you know like you say, sugar-free candies. I mean, oh, okay. they're, they're, you know, obviously sugar candies, but you know that, but I wasn't sure if there was anything that, you know. Okay. So that's a very good point. And, uh, and by the way, I realized why I couldn't hear you. I had turned my computer off because every once in a while it's making little dinging noises. Okay. Uh, the, uh, but I'll leave it on. The, uh, yes, sugar-free candies are excellent. And you will hear many dentists recommend xylitol as a particular sugar, non-sugar sweetener you should use. Um, recently, uh, about five years ago, we found that there's really no difference between using xylitol, which is a very expensive sweetener, and sorbitol and some other non-sugar sweeteners. Um, but definitely stay away from anything that has sugar or honey in it. Uh, honey is just as likely to cause tooth decay as any other sugar. Um, when you have gastroesophageal reflux disease, many people will want to use uh, antacids, which I recommend, but use antacids that do not have sugar in them. Um, if you are uh, prescribed a medication, especially a liquid that has sugar in it, see if you can... Uh, you know, something that's supposed to stay in your mouth. See if there's an option for something that's sugar-free. Oh, good, good. Good information. Thank you, doctor. You're I'll welcome. Move, I'll move to the next slide. Okay, thank you. 
so Cafasol is a product that was developed here at my school by um, the man who was dean of my school when I was a student here way back when. My 35-year reunion is coming up and also one of my mentors who still teaches here. So this is a solution that's highly concentrated calcium and phosphate. And you have to mix the blue and the white tubes together into a cup. And then you have to rinse with them within 15 minutes where the calcium starts to precipitate out. You rinse with half of the cup on one side of your mouth for one minute and then half of the cup on the other side for one minute. You can use it several times a day. You do need a prescription for this for some reason that I don't understand. And, uh, and also for a reason I don't understand, it's a little hard to find, but this is called Cafasol and it's very effective at not only reducing tooth decay, but actually turning small cavities around. Uh, next slide, please. Everyone who has high risk for tooth decay should be using a stronger fluoride toothpaste. Prevident is made by the Colgate Company. Um, I mention them because this is uh, the product that most dentists will write the prescription for, but there are um, generics available that are just as effective. It has three times the normal concentration of fluoride that you would see in, uh, in over-the-counter Colgate toothpaste. Excuse me. <coughs> the, uh, when you use this toothpaste and when you use any fluoride toothpaste, you should brush your teeth, spit the excess out, and not rinse with water right away. It's like you're giving yourself a fluoride treatment as if you're at the dentist every day. And for someone who has very high risk or extreme risk for tooth decay, you should use a product like this, a high concentration fluoride toothpaste, a prescription fluoride toothpaste, twice a day. If you uh, are high risk, but maybe not getting cavities as often as some other people who are high risk, then maybe once a day would be adequate. On to the next slide. Another very effective way to cut down on tooth decay is if when you go to the dentist or your dental hygienist to have your teeth cleaned, they applied fluoride varnish to your teeth. This is one of the very effective ways to reduce, reduce tooth decay in adults. And on to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about the medications that can increase your salivation. So these medications are called muscarinic agonists. They work on your, uh, on your sympathetic nerves, the nerves that you have no control over that go to your salivary glands. And using these medications tricks your salivary glands into thinking that you should be salivating more. And it wakes up the glands and makes them pump out more saliva. It it's a very slow working medication. You will have to take it for six to 12 weeks before you notice an effect or before it reaches the full effect. You have to be patient. I've heard from some physicians that it doesn't work right away, so they increase the dose, and then the patient has side effects that they don't want. So do not. Uh, do not increase the dose, just wait for it to start to work. And for most people, it will work and you'll notice the effect after about six weeks. Now, what are the side effects you have to look out for? The main side effect that you have to look out for is it will not only increase how much you salivate, but it can increase how much you sweat. I have not heard from my patients that they've had a problem with this. But it's, it's a very important warning that if you are taking a medication like Evosac or like Salogen and you feel like you're sweating much too much that you should cut back on the dosage and yet continue taking the medication. 
if you sweat too much, not only is it uncomfortable, but you can become dehydrated. On to the next slide. There are contraindications. You may not be able to take EvoSac or so. Uh, if you have uncontrolled asthma, if you are allergic to this medication, if you have acute iritis, um, which is a problem with your eye, if you have narrow angle glaucoma, then you may not be able to use this medication and you should discuss this with your physician. On to the next slide. Um, I have some more safety information about this medication on these slides. And uh, if you like, you are welcome to a copy of the slides. Uh, let's go on to Salogen or Evosac, which is slide number 20. I always like to mention my student, uh, Craig Holiday. Craig Holiday, uh, I think it was his great great grandfather's brother was Doc Holiday uh, from the gunfight at the yes. Olympic Corral, who was a, uh, a uh, he's one of the most well known dentists in history. Um, so, um, and interesting that uh, that Craig was put into a uh, clinic group with two faculty members who are experts on Doc Holliday. So uh, he did a little research on the effects of pilocarpine and sevamelin. So these are Evosac and Salogen. And Remember, pilocarpine or salogen is the older medication, and sevamelin or evosac is the newer medication. He did a chart review to look for side effects from the two medications. And what he found was that uh, pilocarpine or salogen seems to be associated with more reporting of side effects and lower adherence rate. While I understand that that was his findings from looking at the charts, the medical records of our patients here at the school, Salogen is an older medication and associated with the use of older medications for, uh, for scleroderma overall. So we know that there, the side effects of some of the medications uh, earlier on were uh, worse than the side effects of the medications that we're using now. Uh, so I would caution that even though uh, Craig did an excellent job with his research, I would still try using Salogen or, or Pilocarpine first because it's much less expensive than Sevamelin or Evosac. And if pilocarpine does not do the job for you, or if you're suffering with side effects, then try switching to sevamelin. On to the next slide. A very high percentage of people, I'm not going to get into exact numbers, but a very high percentage of people who have scleroderma have gastroesophageal reflux disease. So this is where acid from your stomach comes back up your esophagus and can end up in your mouth. And it can cause a host of maladies like sinusitis, like uh, problems with your lungs, and it eats away at your teeth. And what you may hear from dentists who don't realize that there's this association between gastroesophageal reflux disease and, uh, and problems with teeth, they say, oh, you're grinding your teeth a lot. Oh, you're drinking too much soda and it's eating away at your teeth. Um, oh, maybe you're making yourself throw up and you have an eating disorder. But I think that we understand that with scleroderma, you have this issue with stomach acid getting into your mouth. And um, I use this slide to educate dentists on the issue. So first, the uh, picture of the, of the patient's upper teeth. This is someone who has no other issue except that he has gastroesophageal reflux disease 
and the constant stomach acid has eaten away on the tongue side and the biting surface of his upper teeth. Not so much his lower teeth, but also some. Uh, on the left side of this slide, you see that the biting surfaces of the teeth have been eaten away by stomach acid. And the interesting thing to me, and something that I did not understand when I first started studying gastroesophageal reflux disease, is the silver fillings were a little bit higher up than the surface of the tooth all the way around as if the dentist did that on purpose. But what's happening here is the stomach acid eats away at the tooth faster than it eats away at the metal. And by the way, uh, there is evidence, one of my students just taught me about this two weeks ago, there is evidence that if you have gastroesophageal reflux disease, you are more likely to have new tooth decay around tooth colored fillings than you are around silver fillings because the metal ions in the silver counteracts the, uh, the acidity. And then the dental x-ray image that you see is a patient who had several new fillings. And then a year later, she came to see me again for uh, another exam and she had a brand new cavity that she did not have before, all related to gastroesophageal reflux disease and not her diet. So the point here is it's very important to take care of gastric reflux. It's very the other point is, I think you made very, very important, is that um, having uh, your new fillings make sure that they're silver and not uh, cosmetically pleasing to you but uh, basically making sure that they're the right or uh, right thing for the for the tooth right and i know that a lot of people are uh, uncomfortable with silver fillings for uh, for different reasons uh, other than that they don't look the best but they for someone who has gastric reflux that can't be controlled it's a much better way to fix your teeth. So you have to weigh the risks and the benefits. And in the case of someone with gastric reflux, the risk of, uh, of new tooth decay uh, for a filling is much higher than the benefit of the appearance of a tooth colored filling. On to the next. Uh, image, please. So please take the medications, the proton pump inhibitors, the H2 antagonists. I know that there was a recent problem with one of the H2 antagonists, um, but uh, it was not related to it being a medication that treats uh, acid reflux. It was related to how it was manufactured, and I'm sure that they're, they have fixed that already. And if you're using uh, an antacid, please use antacids that do not have sugar. Also, remember that it is important to treat GERD aggressively for reasons of your oral health and also because you don't want it to affect your lungs and your esophagus. With your diet, you have to adjust your diet so that it's a low acid diet. If you drink caffeine, if you drink alcohol, you will have more acid reflux. Do not eat or drink anything for two hours before you go to bed. I know uh, gastroenterologists who will not even talk to you about treating your gastroesophageal reflux disease until you have put blocks or books or bricks under the feet at the head of your bed to raise your head to raise the head of your bed six to eight inches. I know some people like to use a wedge pillow, but uh, if you roll off that pillow, you are now laying flat again. And many people do that at night. Um, consider talking with a nutritionist about your diet also. And have endoscopy to rule out damage to your esophagus from Barrett's esophagus, which is a very serious condition from acid reflux. On to the next screen. 
microsco microstomia is a serious problem for people who have scleroderma. Now, of course, not everyone is affected the same way. And some people may not have any microstomia. Also, some people might not have so much sclerodactyly. But if you have scleroderma and you have microstomia, then there are things that we can do to help you. So for your medical team, if you have this problem, they should refer you to a physical therapist and an occupational therapist. The physical therapist can teach you exercises that will help your hands and your fingers work better. And also that will help your mouth and your tongue work better. The occupational therapist will help teach you to work with the abilities that you have to do a better job eating, cleaning your teeth. And the dental team should alert the medical team when there are problems that arise that interfere with your activities of daily living, including self-care and eating. On to the next slide. So for microstomia, this is a very serious problem when it comes to oral health. We can do some physical therapy to improve your mouth opening and to improve the distance between your upper and lower teeth. And I will show you these exercises. You can have a commissurotomy done. The commissure is the corner of your mouth. So a surgeon can do microsurgery in the corner of your mouth, which, uh, which loosens things up a bit and makes it easier to open. We can adjust our tools and our technique. The first adjustment we need to make is patience. Patience for the dentist, patience for the dental assistant, patience for the patient. It's, it takes longer for me to treat a patient who has scleroderma, even though I have years of experience doing so, than it takes for me to treat a patient who's not affected this way. I may have to use different equipment. I may have to use on my, on my drills, I would have to shorten the drill bits or use drill bits that are specially designed to use on small children. Not a big deal but it's important to realize that this might be necessary. I'm going to show you how to floss with a floss aid. And when we take impressions, we may have to use smaller trays than we would normally use to hold the impression material in your mouth, or we may have to use trays that are the normal size, but with the edges cut away. Or we may want to take an impression using an, an optical device, a camera device, if we have a head on it that's small enough that it can fit into your mouth. And I've done that too. On to the next slide. So here's one of the exercises, one of the classic exercises for improving your embouchure or the circle of your lips. You cross your wrists in, excuse me. <coughs> My mouth is getting dry. I'm just going to pour myself a little more water. You cross your wrists in front of your chest and you hook your thumbs inside the corners of your mouth. Then you, uh, oh, and don't forget to lubricate your lips first. Then you gently push up with your right hand and pull down with your left hand just enough to give you a stretch not enough to hurt, not enough to tear. Do not tear your lips when you do this, please. Then reverse that and push up with your left hand and pull down with your right hand. Do this alternating uh, for maybe about 10 or 15 minutes. And this is something that works really well in the shower with the hot water hitting you in the face, uh, or you can do it sitting in front of the television. You may want to put warm compresses over your mouth first to loosen things up a bit. Uh, the next exercise, please go on to the next slide, is to make a stack of tongue depressor blades. I'm sure that any physician you see, any dentist would be happy to supply you with a stack of about 30 tongue depressor blades. 
fit as many as you can in between your teeth. And when you have fit as many as you can in between, wrap a rubber band around it. And then slide in one more. And then maybe even slide in one more. Don't make it so thick that it's causing you any kind of pain in your jaw joint. We do not want to cause pain in your jaw joint. We don't want to dislocate anything, but we just want to give it a stretch. Once you have the maximum number in between your teeth that give you a nice comfortable stretch, leave that in there, leave that stack of tongue depressor blades in your mouth for 10 to 15 minutes. This is a great one to do while you're watching TV. Do not do this in the shower. Uh, God forbid you fall in the shower and, uh, and have an accident with a stack of tongue depressor blades in your mouth. Uh, on to the next slide. There, is also, uh, there are also a couple of machines that your physician can prescribe for you. Dentists uh, won't be able to prescribe this because it needs to go through your medical insurance and dentists are not providers under your medical insurance. Um, these are called the Therabyte and the Aura Stretch. They are kind of expensive to use. My understanding is that the insurance covers the cost of the device but does not cover the cost of the replacement pieces. So you can see on the Therabyte there are pieces that, uh, or, and on the Aura Stretch, there are pieces that fit um, on the arms of this device. Yes, those little white pieces. And um, these, so the Therabyte opens up your bite and the Theris, and the Aura Stretch stretches out your cheeks. This is a nice thing to use if someone has to do these exercises for you because it's a little more clinical than sticking their thumbs inside your mouth and stretching that way. On to the next one, please. The exercises only work as long as you continue to do them. If you back off, things will tighten up again. On to the next one. Now I'm going to talk about adaptive toothbrushes. The Dext brush is a brush that was designed for people who have rheumatoid arthritis. This is not a good brush for people who have scleroderma and microstomia because it's a very large head that's hard to fit into your mouth. The brush on the right, and I'm sorry, I don't have the name of it written there, is called the Benefit Plus Toothbrush. So the one all the way on the right where you see it's red and black and blue. So there's actually three brushes in that bundle. There's a white one that fits on top of your teeth. And with this brush, you're brushing the cheek side of the tooth, the tongue side of the tooth, and the biting surface of the tooth all together. And they're all bundled together in by this rubber sleeve. And the nice thing about it is it's a bigger, heavier thing to hold on to than just a standard toothbrush. Of course, you could take a manual toothbrush and wrap duct tape around it or something to make it thicker. And go on to the next slide, please. So that's a benefit plus, and it's only available, as far as I know, online, not very expensive. Uh, you can use a manual toothbrush. If you use a manual toothbrush, I recommend that you use a small head toothbrush. Many people like to get the biggest toothbrush that they can get, like an Oral-B 60. Those are too big if you have microstomia. Get a small adult toothbrush like an Oral-B 30 or 35. And once again, I do not own stock in Oral-B. I'm just telling you that because I know that's a very popular um, manual toothbrush company. Also, their electric toothbrush is a very good product. I like the little round head that it has. Use a rechargeable Oral-B toothbrush because the heads on this brush do not spin completely around. They spin a quarter turn one way and then a quarter turn the other way. And this back and forth motion is very effective. Uh, these toothbrushes work very well. There are generic replacements available for the heads of the Oral-B power toothbrush. I recommend them. I like an electric toothbrush because it has a fatter handle, easier to hold on to if you have sclerodactyly. 
Also the Sonicare toothbrush, once again with a small head, is very effective and a very good product. On to the next slide. When you can't hold the dental floss, it's a good idea to get a floss fork. Now there's something called a floss fork where you have to wrap the floss around a button on the handle and wrap it around the little arms and then wrap it around the other, uh, wrap it around the button again. A uh, little hard to do if you have sclerodactyly. The reach access flosser, once again, I have no interest in this company. Uh, it is basically a toothbrush size handle with little bows that look like tiny bows for a bow and arrow set that snap into the head. Very easy to use. Uh, you can once again wrap the handle with duct tape to thicken the handle to make it easier to hold if you have sclerodactyly. And you can um, easily use this to floss between your teeth. I like this much better than the floss picks, these little individual uh, disposable devices, because this holds the floss at the correct angle. And with the handle, it's much easier to hold than a disposable floss pick. So once again, a highly recommended device. And when you go to your dentist or your dental hygienist, bring your reach access flosser with you because they may not have one. And if they go to floss your teeth, you know they press, we're going to press the floss into the corners of your mouth and that's painful. And I wanna thank um, a room full of scleroderma patients in Philadelphia back in, when was it? 2008, who told me about this device and how great it is. Uh, on to the next page. So the very first patient who told me that they had, she had a problem accessing dental care was the person that these images belong to. She told me that she had been uh, going to the same dentist for a very long time and she had been suffering with the effects of scleroderma for many years. And then she went to her dentist and she said, hey, I have a diagnosis, I have scleroderma. And he told her that she needed to find a dentist who knows how to treat scleroderma. Um, it was very easy for me to find someone to help her. And one of my co-teachers here at uh, Tufts Dental School is taking care of her. They live in the same town. Um, I wanna talk, I wanna use Carol's image to talk about multiple tooth resorption syndrome. So this is something that affected Carol and affects by my estimation, based on looking at images and based on talking with patients, and this is not from scientific data, it affects about 5% uh, of people who have scleroderma, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. And if you don't have scleroderma, only maybe one in a million people have this condition. So resorption, tooth resorption happens when cells inside and around the tooth start eating away at the tooth. And you can see in the image on the left, somebody noticed, a dentist noticed that she was having resorption of the inside of the tooth and did root canal treatment on it. And that's what that white line is in the middle of the root of the tooth. And the resorption continued, resorbing the tooth around that root canal filling. You can also have resorption on the outside of the tooth and it might look like tooth decay and I'll have an interesting image to show you uh, next. So if we can go on to the next image and the next one, yeah. So in this case, this is a particular case. It was a 56 year old man who came to see me at my practice five miles north of Boston. He had, his chief concern was that he had a recent diagnosis of scleroderma and he heard that I was the scleroderma dental guy and he should come and see me, but he wasn't having any trouble with his teeth. I went over his health history. I looked at what medications he was taking. I did a thorough exam. I found that he had no issues with oral cancer that I could tell. Uh, 
he had several fillings, but not a lot. Um, he had slight gingivitis, which is a very mild form of gum disease that most people have. And on his x-ray in the middle of the tooth on the left-hand side of both of those images, please go back, on the middle of the uh, tooth on the left-hand side of both of these images, you'll see there's a dark gray area. And can you point to that dark gray area on the tooth all the way on the left of both of those images? Nope, nope, inside the tooth. On the left, right there, right there. See that? Yes, that's it. So that was interesting to me because I could tell from the two x-rays using a triangulation technique that this was happening on, this, on the outside surface of the root, but underneath the gum. And if you'll go to the next, x, the next uh, image or the next slide, so on the left, I'm holding a probe with millimeter markings on the surface of the gum. And the tip of that probe is where the topmost edge of that uh, hole in the tooth is. And the gum covers up the bottommost edge of that hole. And when I peeled the gum away, I could see that that so this is the next one, the next image on the right on the top. I peeled the gum away and that hole was full of tissue and the tissue was eating away at the tooth or appeared to be eating away at the tooth. I saved that tissue. I'll show you another image in a minute. And then I filled it with a tooth colored filling material and then on to the next image. And these are the microscope slides from the tissue that was inside the tooth. So I spoke to my friend, the oral pathologist, Jonathan Garlick, who has been doing a lot of research on scleroderma lately here at Tufts also. And uh, Dr. Garlick found that tissues that normally make fibrinogen or fibroblasts had somehow turned into cells that eat away at the teeth and the bone called macrophages. And let me see. Um, so somehow scleroderma changes these normal cells into cells that eat away at teeth and bone. So in a way, it's own autoimmune thing, right? It, right. So this is related yeah. to, uh, it's related to the autoimmunity. It's related to scleroderma. Wow. And we don't know how to treat this. What I can tell you is if you have a tooth that is being eaten away by, um, by, this, um, by these tissues, it's not something that we can fix. And those teeth are going to be destroyed. And it's better to figure out how we're going to replace them. Just let them be until they break or become uncomfortable and then replace them because all of the time and effort that you spend on root canal treatment, on fillings, on, uh, on crowns for these teeth can be better spent elsewhere. On to the next slide. Such as with dental implants. So this dental implant uh, case was done by, the implant itself was done by one of my classmates, Dr. Kat Trambone. Uh, he's an oral surgeon here in Massachusetts. He did a wonderful job. And this patient actually knew him and his family from high school. Uh, it, he, he and the patient apparently went to high school together. And um, she lost a tooth. He replaced it with an implant. And this is holding up very well. So dental implants seem to have a similar success rate with or without scleroderma. The only thing I would caution patients and doctors about is if, you're, if you wanna place an implant into an area that's having osteolysis, like that patient early on who's where the bone was eaten away by, uh, 
by scleroderma from around the roots of the teeth, that's probably not a good idea. Let's see, on to the next slide. Oh, when you have microsto microstomia, it becomes very hard to place dental implants, but it's really helpful if you have a surgeon who is as accomplished as Dr. Kat Trambone and certain other surgeons that I've worked with who are able to angle everything in such a way. And by the way, this patient, interestingly, had no problem with microstomia, even though she had had scleroderma for a long time. And, and her sclerodactyly was very mild. Um, on to the next slide. So remember that um, many medications will have oral effects. There are uh, over 425 medications that cause dry mouth or xerostomia. <clears throat> A very common medication that's used in scleroderma um, and in uh, cardiovascular health called nifedipine will cause your gums to swell. Your gums will swell less if you do a good job with, your, with cleaning your teeth. But if your gums become very swollen due to um, this type of medication, you do need to have a type of, a very minor type of gum surgery, but we just need to trim away the extra gum and it will not affect the long-term health of your gums or teeth. You can get sores from some medications. You can have irritation of the lining of the mouth. You can have candidiasis or thrush. You can have a change in taste. Uh, dysgeusia is one of my, uh, one of the words that interests me most. Uh, I just like the way the word looks and the way it sounds. And what it means is that you're having something that makes things taste wrong. Even just having dry mouth can cause dysgeusia by making it so that you can't taste things as well. And then we know that some medications, oh, and there are over 60 medications that cause dysgeusia. And there are over, uh, there are many medications that can cause osteonecrosis or bone death of the jaw. Very common ones are bisphosphonates like Fosamax and um, many people who have scleroderma will be taking bisphosphonate medications. Also, steroids can cause uh, bone death of the jaw. You are much less likely to have osteonecrosis or bone death if you are taking very good care of your teeth and gums. On to the next slide. Now, here's that slide, that question about finding a dentist. So there are a few strategies that I have when a patient asks me to help them find a dentist. There are some dentists who have special training to work with patients who have autoimmunity. Students at many dental schools rotate through special care clinics. We have a very well respected special care uh, series of clinics here at Tufts. Uh, they're located all over Massachusetts. Um, Oral medicine and public health dentists are specialists who have extensive training to work with patients who have chronic illness. These specialists may be hard to find, but you can find them at dental schools. You can find them at tertiary care hospitals, big hospitals, and you can find them through the Special Care Dentistry Association. Um, general practice residencies, these are hospital residencies for dentists. Graduates of those residencies often have experience working with uh, patients who have scleroderma. And uh, advanced education in den general dentistry or an AEGD is another way that dentists may get experience working with scleroderma patients. And pediatric dentists have a lot of training on uh, to work with patients who have chronic illness. They can treat patients, pediatric dentists can treat patients who are under general anesthesia. They may have 
the smaller, well, they are going to have the smaller equipment that make it easier to treat people who have microstomia. So if your general dentist feels that they can't treat you for some reason, you can ask them if they can recommend a pediatric or a child specializing dentist who might be able to treat you. SCDAonline.org is the internet home of Special Care Dentistry Association. They have a find a dentist link. So you click on find a dentist and you put in your zip code or your town and they will help you find the nearest special care dentist for you. Uh, call the dental schools, ask for the oral medicine department, uh, tertiary care hospitals. And if worse comes to worse, you can email me and I will help you. Uh, I do not carry around a list of dentists in different towns who take care of patients who have scleroderma, but I will do my best to help you find somebody. And if you have a dentist who you appreciate, who has the patience to be a good dentist for you, but they just feel like they don't know what to do for someone who has scleroderma, they are welcome to email me and I will work with them and I will make sure that they know everything that they need to know. I'm happy to do that as a volunteer with the Scleroderma Foundation. On to the next slide. So here's the summary for the dental side. Tell your dentist you have scleroderma and how it affects you. Don't hide it. You will need annual x-ray imaging it's very important for prevention when you have high risk for tooth decay and when you have scleroderma. Bring your list of medications and your physicians and also know what each medication is prescribed for. That's very important for the dentist to know. Schedule your appointments for the best time of day for you. So my, when I was practicing, like I said, up until last uh, April, my staff knew that I was not going to do a root canal past six o'clock at night because I would be afraid I'd be too tired. But they also knew that if I had a patient who had a chronic illness like scleroderma, we had to treat them at the best time of day for them for whatever reason, and we would make exceptions. Um, do your physical therapy, your mouth opening exercises right before your dental appointment. You can do it while you're sitting in the waiting room. You can do it while you're sitting in the operatory waiting for the dentist. But this is uh, very important to loosen things up. Please bring gloves and a blanket to the dental office uh, and let the dental staff know if the air conditioning is a problem for you. Remember, we're walking around wearing gowns, we're wearing gloves, we're wearing masks. We are hot and you do not want a hot, annoyed dental assistant passing instruments over you to the dentist. Um, but we will understand, and my staff knew that if someone who had scleroderma was coming into the office, we were going to turn off the air conditioner right then. So the room might be cool, but at least it wouldn't be blowing on them. And, um, and also in my practice, we had blankets available that we kept clean for patients who have rain on that, that, that's, a, that's a good point for any time uh, the patients go to any of the other doctors that they have to see. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And remember that orthodontic treatment is often okay, not always, but often okay if you have scleroderma and it's effective. Um, I'm, I've seen how when you have scleroderma, uh, because of the pressure of your cheeks on your teeth, it can make your, and the way that scleroderma makes it so that you can't close your lips together all the way, your teeth might protrude. And orthodontics can help bring your teeth back inside your lips. And then your orthodontist may need to attach a wire to your teeth to hold them in that position rather than giving you removable retainers. So you would have a, a retainer that's bonded in place rather than a retainer that comes out when you need. On to the next page, please. 
and your medical team will want to diagnose and treat xerostomia, dry mouth. Diagnose and treat gastroesophageal reflux disease aggressively. So I know some physicians will um, believe that if you have a little acid reflux, not a big deal. But if you have a little acid reflux, what they think of as a little acid reflux, it may be causing some severe damage to your teeth. Watch for side effects of medications that may affect your oral health. Prescribe physical and occupational therapy because dentists, we do not have the ability to prescribe physical therapy and prescribe occupational therapy. We can make rest recommendations, but we don't have connections to, to the, that group of professionals. And also physicians should make sure that their patients have a dental home, have a dentist that they're seeing regularly. Also, it might be that rheumatologists who take care of patients who have scleroderma uh, should know who the dentists are around them who treat patients, who, uh, who are comfortable treating patients who have scleroderma. And it would be nice if your medical professionals or your pharmacist could provide that medication list. Um, on to the next page. You can download this brochure from scleroderma.org. Uh, I wrote this brochure with the help from uh, people at the Scleroderma Foundation, which interestingly, the Scleroderma Foundation, the national foundation, is housed in a building about 15 minutes away from where I live. And on to the next page. This is my contact information. It's best to get in touch with me by email. I often am in situations where I cannot answer the phone, but what I would do if we need to speak on the phone is set up an appointment so that um, I know that both of us are free to be able to talk. Well, doctor, let me just say thank you very, very much. And let me apologize to everyone during the little technical difficulties that we had in the middle. I'm, I believe that we got through it. And um, what a very, very informative and educate, uh, uh, made, made me understand a little bit more about some of the issues that even though they're not prevalent within the naked eye is that there are things that the x-rays will show that uh, I did not understand. And thank you very much for having me. I uh, enjoyed doing the webinar this way. And hopefully you'll be able to cut and paste a little bit. Well, if we can't, like I said, that's why I'm going to throw the apology in there right now. We had about two or three minutes worth of the thing. So, Michael, would you like to wrap it up, or you got any questions for the well, doctor? I, I, I got a couple questions, be, or sure. just statements, basically, because I am a patient advocate with this disease. Mm -hmm. And you, you nailed so many questions. Um, and working with my dentist, I'm, I'm in, a, in Michigan in a small town, about 4,800 people. So our selection of dentists at number one take of my insurance is limited. I had a little trouble with my dentist trying to understand scleroderma, and he still doesn't quite get it. Um, but the, uh, the, the dentalist, hygienist that, per, you know, clean my teeth and stuff finally realized that you can't lay me flat. I can't lay flat because of the GERD. But um, I have horrible GERD and so that, but last fall i was at a convention in dc with scleroderma patients and somebody brought up at the table about what is the sign that you're having a flare you've heard flares referred to in scleroderma and it wasn't until i heard that comment that my flare-ups start in my mouth interesting i get oral sores like little ulcerations like um i've had like too much acidic food or something like that and it's not after aspirating but it generally is the onset of when I go into a flare. So um, that's very interesting to hear that. But I also got into my dentist when I had a abscess tooth once, he wanted to give me a specific antibiotic. And I said, that's on my list of no, no antibiotics. Right. And he looked at me like I, you know, I'm questioning his authority. And I said, I have scleroderma. There are antibiotics that will put me into SIBO or C. diff. And I'm not going to the ER, so you've got to give me a different antibiotic. Well, we, we're we still good and we get along well. It's just learning because he's not new on this. So I'm, once this is published, I'm going to have him 
get him a copy of this so he can watch it. But absolutely, uh, and it's very it's very interesting because right now it was interesting. The day I was diagnosed, the the next day when I returned to work, I was eating a soft shelled wrap sandwich or whatever, and I, and I broke a back molar. Oh. Um, you know, this is the day after I'm diagnosed and the doctor had told me I had, you know, a short life to live at the time. I'm, I'm so far two mm -hmm. years past what he said. So anyway, but I just kind of looked up and said, what now? But now I understand why I've had the teeth issues. Um, I had braces as a child. My teeth feel like they're all pushed together now and they're getting out of alignment. And there's times like the flare ups, they just hurt. It's like I've had an intense cleaning on every tooth in my mouth, but now this makes sense. I also have Sjogren's, so you know, let's throw that in, and the GERD, so it's great. But anyway, I appreciate this. This is very educational. So um, with that said, thank you so much, Dr. Leader, for presenting for us today this into the Scleroderma Foundation. And hopefully with my intro, you do get the promotion that I gave you. So you know, hopefully you, know, you get that. So anyway. Thank you for helping to educate the scleroderma community and thank you also for doing so much for our scleroderma community because like I said, this is very educational. Staying thank educated you. about our diseases and the diseases that affects the life of our loved ones can help you become a more effective healthcare advocate. If you have questions about anything that has pre been presented on this webinar, it is best to bring them to your medical team as they know your specific medical needs and they can help you make the right decisions. Thank you again for viewing today's webinar. And thank you, folks. All right. And we're out.